In my hand, I have a ball. I just love the game. I've, I've never been a millionaire, but I've lived like one all my life. You know, I made the right decision going to teaching because, you know, the old thing, the old saying, you know, those, those that can do, those that can't teach, you know. I'm not going to go to university. I'm not one for the books. I had no academic passion at all, so to speak. So I decided it was going to be golf. January 1953, Swatko Country Club. My life really changed that day. There I was, lunchtime at the club, just outside Dale Hayes' father, Otway's Pro Shop, lying in a carry cot. Can you imagine Dale Hayes in a carry cot, the way he looks now? But there was something in his eye, I knew there was trouble ahead. And I wish now that I'd just reached down in front of his mother, Glenn, and strangled the little so-and-so, because all the grief he's given me from then on. Anyway, Dale has been a great friend over the years. I've taught him all he knows, but happily not all I know, not yet. Well, Hutchie, you know, I think that's a little bit unfair because I've dedicated my life to making you famous. But Hutchie, thanks very much for joining us. You've just celebrated your 82nd birthday. There's probably nobody in South Africa that has seen as much golf and has played as much golf as you have. You're the most experienced person that I can think of in South Africa. I want to just ask you a few questions. Bobby Locke, just how good was he? Well, honestly, Dale, I still believe, and I say this with full belief, he's still the best player I've ever seen. I've seen guys hit it further, higher, you know, wider, but I've never seen anybody play as well as Bobby. He never seemed to pull the wrong club. He hit it exactly the right length all the time, doesn't play off yardages. and. To me, I mean, you never saw him in trouble. And if he happened to play poorly, he shot 72 or something ridiculous. But I mean, to me, he is still the best player of golf that I've ever seen. And uh, to give you an idea, I, I met uh, in America many years ago, Bruce Devlin, who you all, all remember, the great Australian player. And uh, he introduced me to uh, Claude Harmon, who won the 48 Masters. And when he said, I'm Dennis Hutchinson from South Africa, he looked at me and Claude said, you know what? He said, we had to ban that old bastard, Bobby Locke. He said he was too good for all of us. An unsolicited comment. And so that'll give you an idea how great Bobby was. Yeah, and what makes that even more amazing was that he was playing against, I mean, true greats of the game. Ben Hogan, Sam Snead, Byron Nelson, Jimmy Demerat. You know, some well, of the greatest players of all time. Oh, absolutely. Well, Clayton Hift, of course, made a fortune because he, he was beaten by Bobby. The first tournament Bobby played in, event, in America that and that was way back in 1948, was uh, in a closed event in North Virginia, which he won by 10 shots. And he said, who's this boy? He said, how could he, you know, win by 10 shots and organize a game? And he said, you keep your mouth shut, I'll make a fortune. And he just backed Bobby every week. And uh, of course, Bobby, I think, won 17 events in America in two years. Unbelievable performance. And of course, one of those is still a record margin victory in the Chicago tournament. Yeah, you know, the Chicago victory opening, won by 16 shots. So that's right, fantastic. Now he was, he was that sort of player, Dale, as you remember. Well, well, you wouldn't, but your dad would. I mean, your dad was the only player that really beat him in a 20-year spell here from 35 to 55. In a match play event, your dad beat Bobby. But uh, <clears throat> he used to shoot 468s or whatever it was, win the tournament. But if anybody pushed him, he just used to go underground. Like poor old Tommy Trevena, one year at Springs, in the old East Rand Open at Springs Country Club. He opened up with a 68, Bobby was 69. And then uh, Tommy followed that with a 66. We were still playing. 36 holes, 36 holes. And I was playing with Bobby when the announcement came out that Tommy had shot 66 in the afternoon, par 73. And Bobby sort of listened, had another look at the putt, 30 footer, hadn't gone two yards, he was reaching for the cap. As he did, he just went cold in the ball, went and brought out in 32, brought him back in 30, 62. And poor old Tommy shot 16 under par and lost by 14. <laughs> and Bobby shot 262, unbelievable. We've had many great golfers in South Africa, but uh, I think I can say, unfortunately, one who's often overlooked uh, is a great friend of yours, Harold Henning, because his career was at the same time as Gary Player. Yeah, I think people didn't really get the right idea about it. Harold, he was a terrific player. I mean, he won over 50 events. 
around the world. I mean, Harold won everywhere. He went, and then, of course, he won in the senior tour as well. When he'd stopped playing for nearly 10 years, but but Harold was his own man. He did it his own way. You never, you wouldn't let anybody watch him practice. He always used to practice somewhere else. But definitely, he was overshadowed to a great deal by Gary Player, and probably did not get the recognition that he deserved. Now, both he and, and Bobby Locke, of course, not that Harold, I don't think, was in Bobby's class, but both great putters. Unbelievable putters, you know. And, and I, well, I think most of all our great players have all been terrific putters. And there's no question, I think, because of the greens we learnt on. If you don't make a good strike, and especially in the old days with the nappy green, or what they called uh, grey and we call nap, but if you don't strike the ball perfectly, it will never stay on the line. And I think we develop putters in this country that actually hit the ball beautifully on the greens squarer than most, of, most other places. I think it would be fair to say that uh, over the years you've had a love-hate relationship with Gary Player. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't always see eye to eye about things, Gary and I, let me put it that way. But Gary is probably the greatest competitor, I think, I've ever seen on the golf course. I mean, nobody ever wanted to win as much as Gary. And, uh, and sometimes he could be awkward to play with because of, of, of the way he felt about the game. But you can't take anything away from what Gary did. He was a fantastic performer. And it's just, uh, you know, the pity we didn't always see eye to eye. We get on fine. So hello, Gary. Now he's always, always a laugher, like his father. And uh, I can only say well done to what Gary did. When you look back, you know, you look back at his record, you know, only Tiger and Nicholas since the Second World War have won more majors than Gary. I oh, mean, it's pretty amazing. No, it, no, it looked fantastic. And to think he, when he turned pro, both he and Harold, fun enough, when I first met you, you so in 1953, they both turned pro after the uh, Transvaal Amateur that was played at Glendale Golf Club. And uh, I, I don't even think Gary qualified to play. He was like a 4-5 handicap when he turned pro. Harold, of course, could play. And, but determined he was going to be the best player in the world, and he really did get there. And that, actually, I, I've got one little record I might be quite proud of. I might be the only player that played a competitive round with the big three. Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus and Gary Play in, in the World Cup in Hawaii in 1964 we were drawn together, so and, and actually a competitive round in that World Cup. That's amazing, you played all three of them in one day? One day, yeah. you know, the, the team, they were Arnie and Jack were the team, and we were playing for America, and we played for South Africa. And of course you saw Hogan and Sneed and everyone yeah. else play. Well, I saw Hogan, I think, still hit the three best shots I ever saw, hit in my life, and uh, I followed him for a few holes at uh, the tournament they play at, uh, at, at Fort Worth, is it? Colonial. Colonial, that's it. And this long par three into the wind, the, the wind was blowing like billy And uh, don't watch other guys hitting one irons, two irons in there. And those, and I'm going back to 1960. And he got there and he just took this four wood or whatever it was out of the bag, three wood maybe. And he just, pin was right in the front. He just gave a little bunt with about four inches of, of grip showing. A foot, truce bob right at the hole. He just turned to the caddy, another ball, a little less, it'll cut up into the back right corner and put a green like this with a slope. And then another ball caddy and just drilled it straight into the back left corner, into a strong wind, and put the club in the bag and just walked off. And I thought, well, you know, I might as well be watching a machine and I, I never watch a bit another shot. It was, it was just so machine-like. You know, I, I preferred watching more human people like Julie Boris and those guys. <laughs>